Today I'm going to talk about um, some work that we did. I actually started this work um, about three or four years ago before the before the FDA approval of PEMBRO for non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. And I'll show you sort of what we learned from this uh, study and um, how I think it could influence uh, how we design additional clinical trials. Um, this is my uh, disclosure. Uh, I will talk briefly about work uh, that, uh, that we did as it relates to um, uh, uh, our clinical trial. Uh, this is the uh, landscape of non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. Uh, as, as everyone in this uh, room is aware, uh, it's the most common uh, form of bladder cancer diagnosed each year. 75% of patients uh, diagnosed with bladder cancer will have non-muscle invasive disease. This is a urologist disease, at least I firmly believe that. Um, and the first line treatment uh, for this is uh, intravesical BCG. However, when we look at uh, the effects of BCG on, um, on uh, non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, in particular high risk, I'm talking about high risk non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, not intermediate or low, um, we, we have to recognize that approximately a third of patients are going to fall into the definition of BCG unresponsive, which I'll go into detail about that. I'll give some history around it as well. Um, we also have to acknowledge that an intravesical chemotherapy is less effective than BCG. I'm not showing you the data today, but there are greater than 10 trials that have gone head to head BCG versus chemotherapy, um, and BCG is always uh, superior. And um, I think our alternative to, um, to additional intravesical therapy in our patients that have B, uh, BCG unresponsive is rather is cystectomy. And the sort of the goal today and sort of the where the field is moving is trying to do more bladder preservation. Um, I, I also have to acknowledge that, that we are in a shortage of uh, a BCG. We currently have one manufacturer, which is Tice. Um, and the way that they manufacture BCG is honestly archaic. And, it's a and the way that they do this uh, is, is not reproducible, it's inconsistent, and the mycobacterium oftentimes um, uh, is in a shortage, and I'll show you that data. So we really have to be thinking about what we can do to improve this. Now, uh, I'm not sure if the people in this room know the history around the definition of BCG unresponsive. Um, before uh, 2015, when the FDA uh, asked a number of urologists, um, some of them are in this room today, to come together at GU ASCO and come up with a definition that defines uh, patients that are no longer fit to get additional BCG. Jonathan Jarrow, uh, when he in his position that he was in at that time, asked us to define a better definition of uh, BCG terminology. So this is the term or, or the definition that we came to. Uh, essentially, it's high grade T1 after an, one induction course or development of high grade disease after 12 months. Um, and the purpose of this definition was so we could, so drug companies and we as investigators could put patients on single arm trials. And we're all aware of those trials. We have Pembro, we have atizolizumab, which I'll talk about. So that's why we came up with BCG unresponsive. BCG um, uh, relapsing is high grade disease after a 12 month period of, re of recurrence free survival um, and having no disease. And BCG intolerant is unable to tolerate it. So this is sort of where the state of the art of BCG terminology sits. Now, Merck uh, essentially released this um, last year, early last year, that there will be a permanent shortage essentially of BCG due to the inability to keep up with supply and demand. Um, and, and that begs us as a, as a, as a field to, to be thinking about how we can uh, change this. Um, uh, ben Davies published this in, in 2017 showing that the BCG shortage impacts a number of things. It actually showed that the use of intravesical chemotherapy went up and the price of intravesical chemotherapy went up, suggesting that we are potentially actually giving our patients uh, uh, inferior um, um, options uh, for their disease. So this is the problem today. We, have, we need to increase our availability of BCG and potentially, and I would argue, that we need to enhance the efficacy of BCG, both in the BCG naive as well as in the BCG unresponsive disease. So 
this is sort of the solution as I see it. This is my personal belief. Um, and I think everybody in the field has some form of um, uh, a slide that they could put together like this. I will not be talking about solution four or five due to time, but I will talk briefly about the use of early cystectomy, in the possibilities of increasing availability of BCG, and then the concept of enhancing uh, BCG's immu uh, uh, immune effects, and, and that's the, where we'll focus. Um, BCG, um, uh, high-risk non-muscle vasal bladder cancer, in particular BCG unresponsive disease, is a dangerous disease. We, it is notoriously understaged. And at the time of cystectomy, there can be, uh, there's approximately, it can be upwards of 10 to 15% of patients that already have uh, lymph node positive disease due to understaging and have more advanced disease. So we as urologists will often say, well, we can take out their bladder and, and, we, and we have a way to influence and, and mitigate this. However, we have to acknowledge that bladder preservation um, is important for a lot of patients. Uh, and also patients are oft oftentimes unfit for cystectomy. So as far as the outcomes of early cystectomy, these are patients that we bring to the operating room and take their bladders out before exposing them to multiple courses of intravesical therapy. And it has been shown or sent for almost for decades that these patients clearly have a survival benefit. So we as a field have to figure out who to select to do this for. And I think that there are nomograms for this, but I think we still are going by our, um, uh, by our experience. So this is where we need to also increase our, our, uh, uh, our work. Solution number two would be increasing the availability of BCG. I think um, uh, we, uh, we, there are, we have to acknowledge that there are multiple forms of uh, strains of the mycobacterium. Uh, this is just a schematic showing all the forms of mycobacterium that, that are available, that have been used uh, for TB, for vaccines for TB. Um, and uh, these uh, BCG um, strains are also effective in bladder cancer. There have been a number of trials that have looked at head-to-head -head, uh, strains of BCG. There's only been one trial that showed that BCG Tice was superior um, uh, to the Connaught strain, but that was only one. All the rest of the trials looking head-to-head -head have shown that uh, recurrence-free survival, cancer-specific survival, and overall survival are comparable. So what, uh, what has been done in other countries and what we are attempting to do in the United States is to bring in another strain of BCG that we can utilize um, in our patients. And um, I'll show you uh, how that's being done. But really, um, where we are focusing the majority of, of the research efforts is in how to enhance uh, the effects of, uh, of BCG. So how do we enhance immunotherapy? Um, and we, we, what we found in, in a study that we published a couple of years ago is that the influx of T cells that occurs in the bladder uh, with uh, intravesical BCG is transient. It, you get an influx of T cells, and then those T cells are gone within 48 hours. And the other thing that we found in this study was is that these T cells are actually um, not activated. They're not. They're actually not induced. So they're coming in, but they're not releasing those cytokines that are important for um, uh, for uh, the effects, the oncological effects that we are seeing with BCG. So how do we enhance uh, this effect? Well, one um, approach, it, which is being done by in, in SWOG, this is SWOG 1602, which is this trial that's, um, that is uh, run by Rob Svitek at UT San Antonio. Um, his thought is, and this is data that, that has been shown uh, in the uh, preclinical um, uh, arena, that if we prime the patient, if we give them TB, uh, excuse me, the, uh, the BCG uh, uh, pr uh, subdermal, uh, transdermally, if we prime the patient, they have antigens that are present, and when you give the intravesical BCG, you get more of this T cell response, which may uh, induce or, or get more enhanced uh, immune response. This is a trial that is currently uh, enrolled. I think uh, on the, it's about 560 patients have been enrolled. There's another 200 plus that need to um, be enrolled in this study. And the hope here is, is that, we, that this may be a, a way to do that. The other reason why I'm talking about this is, is because it's comparing Tice BCG to the Tokyo strain of BCG. So if this shows inferiority, that the BCG Tokyo strain is, effect, is, is also effective, then this is also a registration trial that may be able to get uh, BCG Tokyo strain into the United States and help with our uh, BCG shortage. 
Another way to enhance uh, the, the effects of, of BCG and immunotherapy is, is an approach that, that we've done um, at, at Johns Hopkins in my lab, where we actually genetically engineer BCG to overexpress a uh, endogenous uh, sting agonist. So sting is just a way to increase interferon signaling uh, in the uh, bladder by an influx of macrophages and T cells. And what we've shown is, is that, that this is actually uh, far superior than, than wild type BCG. And that we're actually able to get trained immunity where the immune system actually recognizes this and is able to um, induce more of an immune response. And this data will be presented this year at the EAU and the AUA. But really, what I think we have to realize is that, that uh, immune checkpoint blockade for the management of urothelial cancer is, is really here, and, and we are uh, currently um, uh, utilizing this both in patients with uh, metastatic disease and non-muscle invasive disease. And um, this is just a schematic showing the mechanism by which PDL1 and PD1 are, 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 able to, um, are able to inactivate T cells. So you don't get this um, uh, activation and interferon signaling in apoptosis. So the, so the FDA recently approved pembrolizumab for the management of BCG unresponsive disease. This is a monotherapy, and this is a systemic therapy for the treatment of, um, uh, of non-muscle invasive disease. It was approved despite uh, not um, uh, attaining the uh, FDA required uh, CR rate of, uh, of 30% at 12 months. However, because of the unmet need and the lack of what we have to give to patients with BCG and responsive disease, um, uh, the FDA approved this drug. Um, and I, I think we can, we can make, come to conclusions as to, as to the utilization of this. Will this ultimately be utilized? And I think there's protocols that are being put in place. But before this was even uh, proposed, um, there, there was really no science behind uh, who would be responsive and what, uh, what uh, patients actually had upregulation of pdl one and would be responding to this form of therapy. So a number of trials have attempted to look at this. The first trial is Keno 57, which is the PEMBRO trial looking at monotherapy. This was actually uh, the FDA approved. The other trial was, um, was SWOG 1605, for which Peter Black was the PI, uh, national PI. I was actually the PI for ECOG. Um, and this trial was actually stopped early due to um, uh, inferiority. It did not meet its, um, uh, we did not meet our uh, endpoints to, to proceed. So this trial uh, is now stopped. There's additional trials. This is the one that was uh, also going on at the time, which was using combination of BCG with um, with an, uh, with a, um, a PDL1, uh, and also combining this with radiation and the fact. And this is a trial that's ongoing, and we'll learn more about that. But as I stated before, all of this was done before we actually understood what uh, this what was happening in this disease state. Would this uh, treatment be effective? And w w the real question is, um, uh, you know, we, we have shown that you get this recruitment of T cells after BCG. And this isn't, and, and when I say we, I mean the global we and the field. This has been known uh, for, for 30 years. Um, but what can we do to um, actually uh, induce T cells to get this anti tumor adaptive immune response? Is PDL1 the answer? Is PDL1 uh, and PDE1 signaling uh, the mechanism by which um, this occurs? We don't know. And actually, I'll say it again prior to these trials, none of this was done, but we still performed the trial. So the question is what is the utility of PDL1 expression? Is this a predictive or prognostic biomarker? Um, and it, it, it is also not known where, whether BCG upregulates PDL1 uh, in, the, in, the, in BCG unresponsive disease, and may this be a marker of adoptive immune resistance? So this is actually the study that, that we performed. The objective here was uh, to characterize the immune cell and immune checkpoint expression in a cohort of patients that had non-muscle invasive disease that were BCG responders and non-responders. So this, we were attempting at the time when we started this to be able to define, could we predict or come up with a way, a potential mechanism by which a BCG unresponsive disease occurs. 
This was a, um, a, a, a study for which we had to create a tissue microarray array, um, of patients with non-muscle invasive disease. Uh, w importantly, we had their tumor prior to BCG and then their tumor after uh, when they recurred with, at, at the definition of BCG on responsive disease. And then we also follow, had, we required that these patients had two-year follow-up to define them as uh, responders. Um, but we, in the tissue microarray, we did a number of immunohistochemical staining to look at the immune landscape, including CD4, CD8, FOXP3, uh, PDL1, and PDE1. Um, and then uh, we, we obviously compared this between the uh, responders and non responders. We define BCG unresponsive as the definition that was, was put forward by GUASCO at the GUASCO meeting in 2015. So these are the patients that essentially develop uh, BC, uh, high grade disease within six months. Uh, we define BCG relapsing for after 12 months. We also wanted to assess um, the differences in PDL1 expression in the BCG responders. So, would the uh, BCG unresponsive disease um, uh, cause um, a uh, have uh, the mechanism be related to PDL1 expression? And the way we did this was by looking at two antibodies, two clones. Uh, this is important because uh, there is some uh, there is a lot of data that would suggest that uh, PDL1 staining is dependent on uh, the the, uh, the antibody used. And then important we wanted to co-localize this with our T-cells, both CD4 and CD8. Um, this is our cohort just showing that these are our normal uh, BCG unresponsive disease, patients with T1, CIS, and papillary disease. This is just staining looking at the TMA. I put this in here because ultimately what we learned from this was is that a TMA is probably not the right way to go because all you're doing is coring the tumor, and you really need to look at the stroma and the microenvironment around that. From the TMA, we really didn't find anything. Everything was the same. There was no difference in CD4, CD8. There was no difference in PD1, PD1. And we sort of were scratching our heads. So we said, well, this, this is hard to believe that, that there's no change in, in uh, T cell trafficking in response to B, uh, BCG. So let's look at the entire specimen of the tumor. And when we did that and looked at the same markers, what we found then was is that, a pro that 20 to 22 percent of the patients that were BCG unresponsive had PDL1 in the stroma in the, in the uh, TILs, the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. And this would suggest that approximately 20 percent of patients would respond to the addition of uh, PDE1 or PDL1. And we then went ahead and validated this from a cohort at Columbia uh, to show this. And it was actually identical to what the Hopkins cohort was. We then went on and sequenced all the tumors. We actually did a genomic an RNA seq to look at subtype classification. And the reason why I'm not showing you that data, because guess what? We found nothing. There was no difference in subtype classification, basal versus luminal, in our BCG responsive and unresponsive disease. We also found that the, that the, the genomic analysis or RNA seq did not correlate with the immunohistochemistry. So when we're doing this, I would, see, I would argue that doing sequencing may not be the way to, to determine a, uh, a biomarker. Now, the most important, I think, finding from this study was is that, that when you look at uh, CD8 cells and PDL1 cells, look at all the PDL1 cells that are surrounding those CD8 cells. So in that 20% of patients that, that were BCG unresponsive had PDL1 positivity, it was actually uh, affecting uh, CD8 uh, expression. And this is just shown here, bar graph. The last finding of this study, which is also very relevant, is that patients that had PDL1 positive tumors had no CD4 uh, cells there. They had no uh, CD4 positive T cells present. And this was also validated in our Columbia cohort. And when we look at the staining, to look at the different uh, uh, chemical staining of, our, um, uh, of, the, of the different antibodies, this uh, correlated well with that. So what does all this mean, right? What, what does this mean for you and your patients? Um, it means that um, uh, approximately 20 to 25% of patients uh, may benefit from the addition of, P of a systemic uh, checkpoint blockade. The question is, does, is that going to happen alone or in combination with BCG? It's funny that the CR rate for, for Pembro at 12 months was actually 20%. 
which is exactly what we found in our study. And the, what I'm excited about is, is that this actually for the first time presents a potential mechanism by which um, adaptive immune resistance occurs in patients that where immune checkpoint uh, blockade leads to exhaustion of CD8 um, and, and fail of recruitment of CD4, which could be a mechanism by which this occurs. Thank you very much.